Finally, I decided to make the long-distance call I had simulated so well a few days before. It was raining hard when I pulled up in a muddy suburb of Parkington just before the fork, one prong of which bypassed the city and led to the highway which crossed the hills to Lake Climax and Camp Q. I flipped off the ignition and for quite a minute sat in the car bracing myself for that telephone call and staring at the rain, at the inundated sidewalk, at a hydrant, a hideous thing really, painted a thick silver and red, extending the red stumps of its arms to be varnished by the rain which like stylized blood dripped upon its argent chains. No wonder that stopping beside those nightmare cripples is taboo. I drove up to a gasoline station. A surprise awaited me when at last the coins had satisfactorily clanked down and a voice was allowed to answer mine. Holmes, the camp mistress, informed me that Dolly had gone Monday, this was Wednesday, on a hike in the hills with her group and was expected to return rather late today. Would I care to come tomorrow? And what was exactly, without going into details, I said that her mother was hospitalised, that the situation was grave, that the child should not be told it was grave, and that she should be ready to leave with me tomorrow afternoon. The two voices parted in an explosion of warmth and goodwill, and through some freak mechanical flaw, all my coins came tumbling back to me with a hitting the jackpot clatter that almost made me laugh, despite the disappointment at having to postpone bliss. One wonders if this sudden discharge, this spasmodic refund, was not correlated somehow in the mind of McFate with my having invented that little expedition before ever learning of it as I did now. What next? I proceeded to the business centre of Parkington and devoted the whole afternoon, the weather had cleared, the wet town was like silver and glass, to buying beautiful things for low. Goodness, what crazy purchases were prompted by the poignant predilection Humbert had in those days for check weaves, bright cottons, frills, puffed-out short sleeves, soft pleats, snug-fitting bodices, and generously full skirts. Oh, Lolita, you are my girl, as V was Poe's and B Dante's, and what little girl would not like to whirl in a circular skirt and scanties? Did I have something special in mind, coaxing voices asked me? Swimming suits, we have them in all shades, dream pink, frosted aqua, glans mauve, tulip red, ooh-la-la, black. What about play suits? Slips and no slips, low and I loathed slips. One of my guides in these matters was an anthropometric entry made by her mother on Lowe's twelfth birthday. The reader remembers that Know Your Child book. I had the feeling that Charlotte, moved by obscure motives of envy and dislike, had added an inch here, a pound there, but since the nymphette had no doubt grown somewhat in the last seven months, I thought I could safely accept most of those January measurements. Hip girth, 29 inches. Thigh girth, just below the glucial sulcus, 17. Calf girth and neck circumference, 11. Chest circumference, 27. Upper arm girth, 8. Waist, 23. Stature, 57 inches. Weight, 78 pounds. Figure, linear. Intelligence quotient, 121. Vermifor appendix present. Thank God. God. Apart from measurements, I could, of course, visualise Lolita with hallucinational lucidity, and nursing as I did a tingle on my breastbone at the exact spot her silky top had come level once or twice with my heart, and feeling as I did her warm weight in my lap, so that in a sense I was always with Lolita as a woman is with child. I was not surprised to discover later that my computation had been more or less correct. Having, moreover, studied a midsummer sale book, it was with a very knowing air that I examined various pretty articles, sport shoes, sneakers, pumps of crushed kid for crushed kids. The painted girl in black who attended to all these poignant needs of mine turned parental scholarship and precise description into commercial euphemisms, such as petite. Another, much older woman in a white dress with a pancake makeup seemed to be oddly impressed by my knowledge of junior fashions. Perhaps I had a midget for mistress. So, when shown a skirt with two cute pockets in front, I intentionally put a naive male question and was rewarded by a smiling demonstration of the way the zipper worked in the back of the skirt. I had next great fun with all kinds of shorts and briefs, phantom little lolitas dancing, falling, daisying all over the counter. We rounded up the deal with some prime cotton pyjamas in popular butcher boy style. Humbert the popular butcher. 
There is a touch of the mythological and the enchanted in those large stores where, according to ads, a career girl can get a complete desk-to-date wardrobe and where little sister can dream of the day when her wool jersey will make the boys in the back row of the classroom drool. Life-size plastic figures of snub-nosed children with dun-coloured, greenish, brown-dotted, fawnish faces floated around me. I realised I was the only shopper in that rather eerie place, where I moved about fish-like in a glaucous aquarium. I sensed strange thoughts form in the minds of the languid ladies that escorted me from counter to counter, from rock ledge to seaweed, and the belts and the bracelets I chose seemed to fall from siren hands into transparent water. I bought an elegant valise, had my purchases put into it, and repaired to the nearest hotel, well pleased with my day.